call this meeting of the House Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee to order. It is February 22nd, uh, 2022. And uh, we're holding this meeting uh, remotely via Rule 10.01. Uh, we will start out with the roll. Uh, Anna, please go ahead. Chair Becker Finn. Present. Vice Chair Moeller. Present. Representative Scott. Present. Representative Feist. Present. Representative Frazier. Present. Representative Grossel. Present. Representative Hurd. Present. Representative Hollins. Present. Representative Johnson. Present. Representative Liebling. Present. Representative Long. Present. Representative Mortensen. Present. Representative Novotny. Present. Representative Farr. Present. Representative Robbins. Present. Representative Fang. And Representative Zhang. Present. All right, thank you members. Uh, first thing on the agenda today is the minutes. Uh, Representative Frazier, do I have a minute, uh, motion to approve the minutes of February 17th? So moved, Madam Chair. All right, thanks for having your camera on. So I knew you were sort of paying attention. Um, any discussion to the minutes of February 17th? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion is approved. The minutes are, the motion prevails. The minutes are approved. Uh, members, we have uh, a busy day uh, ahead of us, but first on uh, the agenda is uh, House File 1156. It is a Representative Fisher bill. Um, do I have a motion to move House File 1156 to be referred to the General Register? Madam Chair, I'm happy to move House File 1156. All right. Uh, Representative Long moves House File 1156 be referred to the General Register. Uh, Representative Fisher, we will turn it over to you. Please tell us about your bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Committee, for the opportunity to present House File 1156, the Digital Fair Repair Bill. The purpose of this bill is to give consumers the choice, especially in Creative Minnesota, of where to bring their electronic products when they require repair. It helps support and grow Minnesota tech jobs. It guarantees pre-market access, and it helps reduce the growing amount of e-waste that hits our environment. House File 1156 represents the combined interest of individuals who want their freedom of consumer choice and of businesses making their living repairing, refurbishing, reselling, and recycling equipment. Growing limitations on electronic repairs are becoming more and more challenging to consumers. In some cases, businesses are struggling to do their work on behalf of customers and other businesses. Examples are being is when a computer breaks down, a laptop breaks down, many times people have to send that back to a, a service center that is not even in the state. And as a result, to be able to get things done in a timely basis, they are left without a computer to run their business, and they have to sometimes be forced to buying another one and replacing a computer that for $100 or so could have been repaired. And this is the type of thing that we're trying to address. Uh, and the issue that comes out is there are some there are some manufacturers out there who do a good job of making sure that their manuals are available to those who need it, the parts are available, but there are too many that do not. And this creates a problem, not only for business, but also in the agriculture area. I've heard from farmers who've contacted me that they are small farmers and they're located more remotely from the, um, the communities that do have the dealerships, et cetera, and as a result, when their equipment breaks down, they have to wait a couple of days before they're able to get service and get the parts. And this way, this would give them an opportunity to contact the manufacturer directly and get those parts sent directly to them. So it's something that is very important for our, our farms. It's also important for schools. I've heard from a number of uh, it's, uh, educational institutions where they have large numbers of laptops, iPads, et cetera, and they can't always get the parts they need to repair the equipment so that students and teachers are able to continue learning in today's environment. Some of the things that this uh, bill is uh, based on, it is based on a bill that was uh, uh, similar to one in Massachusetts back in 2012 that led to the situation we have today with cars. Back before 2012, if you had an issue with your car, there were very few places that you could go to get it repaired. Uh, based on what was done in Massachusetts, there is now a nationwide uh, uh, compact where you can take your car to any play, uh, any uh, repair shop out there and be able to get it repaired or be able to get the parts and the manuals to repair your car. Uh, you can take it to the repair shops and they're able to get a hold of the diagnostic equipment 
to address your car. They don't have to be the authorized dealers. And the concerns back in the day when this first came into uh, effect is people were concerned that this would cause dealerships to go under. And I take a look today and I see the dealerships up in my district have been growing leaps and bounds. So it doesn't seem to be having an impact on them negatively. And what I do see is that I see more and more repair shops that I've had this freedom to choose where I want to take my car to have it repaired. The nice thing is, is remember cars are very complicated. Uh, the one vehicle I have has got uh, sensors on it so that when I put on the uh, cruise control, it not only senses, you know, keeps me at the same speed, but when it senses traffic is slowing down, it automatically brakes the car, brings it to a full stop. And then when traffic starts up again, it starts the car and brings it forward. It also helps with turning on the, on the highway. It senses where the lanes are and guides turning of the car. Uh, so when we take a look at these vehicles have got are very complicated, very complex. They've got a lot of pollution control, control equipment. And we also notice we don't have problems with people hacking, hacking the cars and causing problems left and right. And so I see this bill as taking that same opportunity that we've developed for cars and bringing it out to the rest of the equipment with, that we have out in today's world and doing so in a safe manner that just authorizes the availability of the parts and the manuals and diagnostic equipment that is needed for people to be able to repair their equipment. I do also have several testifiers here and I will pause at this point in time. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Representative Fisher. We do have a lot of testifiers for this bill. Um, I will note uh, for members in their uh, digital packets, there are quite a few uh, written testimonials submitted as well. I, so first we will go to, uh, we have a video from Attorney General Keith Ellison, uh, if staff can go ahead with that. Hello, my name is Keith Ellison. I'm the Attorney General for the state of Minnesota. And I would like to thank you, Chair Becker, Finn and members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and thank you for accepting my pre-recorded testimony. I'm sorry that I'm not able to be with you today live. I really prefer that. I will tell you why I support House File 1156 and how, if passed, my office will enforce it. My job as Attorney General is to help people afford their lives and live with dignity, safety, and respect. As we all know, it's tough to afford your life these days. Manufacturers limiting where and when and by whom you can get something that you own repaired makes affording your life that much tougher. The Attorney General's office has heard from consumers, quote, if it's my device that's broken, shouldn't I get to decide how it's repaired, unquote? Some people might even be surprised to find out that this problem even exists. After all, if your car gives you an error message, you get to decide whether you're taking it to a dealership, the garage around the corner, or fixing it yourself. But that's not always the case. Many manufacturers control who can repair a device by restricting access to repair manuals and supply chains for the parts, tools, and equipment that are necessary to make the repairs. These manufacturers limit consumer choice to exclusive authorized repair outlets that control when, where, and at what cost repairs are made. Manufacturers even take the decision of when a repair is necessary out of the hands of the consumer. This situation hurts Minnesotans everywhere, whether the items they own are small, like a smartphone, or very large, like farm equipment. The Digital Fair Repair Act benefits all Minnesota consumers by making repair markets competitive. My time is limited, so I won't recap how the bill works. I would only add that it's important to note that the bill does not harm manufacturers. It expressly preserves their ability to protect important trade secrets and requires only that they abandon restrictions on the information, parts, and tools necessary for consumers to restore their purchases to working order. Now, let me turn to enforcement. As for enforcement, the Attorney General's Office will enforce this legislation 
in exactly the same way we enforce existing antitrust and anti-consumer laws. First, we would do outreach to original equipment manufacturers about their obligations under the newly enacted law. Since ideally, this legislation benefits consumers without our office's intervention. If we were to receive a complaint that alleges non-compliance with the Digital Fair Repair Act, we would handle it as if we would any other complaint. First, we would assess whether or not the conduct described violates the law. My follow-up with the consumer and the individual or business complained about. Then, if we determined there had been a non-compliance, we would educate the non-compliant party about what the law requires and give them the opportunity to resolve the matter voluntarily. In our experience, that's always the fastest and most efficient way to resolve the issue and to get the consumer relief. With any violation of consumer protection laws, the Attorney General's office always tries for compliance first. Enforcement always is the last resort. Enforcement can have several steps, the final step of which is the litigation. If it comes to litigation, the Attorney General's office could use our authority under Minnesota Statutes 8.31 to investigate and prosecute, quote, violations of law of this state respecting unfair, discriminatory, or unlawful practices in business, commerce, or trade, unquote. We could pursue permanent injunctive relief, restitution, disgorgement, and civil penalties up to $25,000 per violation. It would be up to a court to determine the size of the civil, of the civil penalty. By the way, it's important to note that any civil penalties my office recovers goes to the state of Minnesota general fund, not to my office fund. The right to repair is a serious problem for many consumers, often one they don't have until they're stuck. The Digital Fair Repair Act expands their rights and my office's ability to help them afford their lives. I urge you to support it. I do, thank you. All right. Uh, next I have, and I will say for testifiers, I, I see we have a member hand up. We'll get to questions at the end. I want to make sure we give all the testifiers the ability to have their time uh, on this bill, and we will be limiting testimony to two minutes. Uh, next, I have Matthew Larsgaard. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Matthew Larsgaard, and I am appearing in opposition to House File 1156 on behalf of the Pioneer Equipment Dealers Association, which represents approximately 150 of Minnesota's farm equipment dealerships. I have submitted my testimony, which outlines our many and significant concerns regarding this legislation. Most of these fall outside of Subdivision 4, which I understand is not the focus of the committee's discussion today. As such, I will briefly state that we are very concerned that this bill will create significant liability exposure for our dealerships, as we believe this legislation creates greater access to what would be otherwise um, unavailable machine operating software that would allow both the illegal and or unsafe modification of equipment, uh, which may create significant liability exposure for our dealers. Uh, some of which would include liability related to personal safety, the deletion of emissions components, manipulation of speed governors, and issues with guidance systems, to name a few. And, and one important note is previous testifiers have mentioned that uh, the auto sector has made strides, has provided the diagnostic repair information to provide, to allow consumers, independent repair shops to perform the repair of motor vehicles. I can tell you that in North Dakota, we also represent the New Car Dealers Association, all the franchise dealers. And the farm equipment sector within the last several years has gone really beyond what the car manufacturers have done in terms of providing repair information, diagnostic tools, information, availability of parts. And comparing a motor vehicle to farm equipment um, may not be an equitable uh, comparison in that motor vehicles don't have the um, 
significant uh, danger associated with the operation of such. When you think about tractors, combines, uh, forage equipment, um, and, and furthermore, the guidance systems on these vehicles are also different. I should say the guidance systems on equipment is also different. Uh, later uh, this Mr. year- Mr. Larsgaard, you'll have to wrap up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my final comment is later this year, a major manufacturer will be introducing a fully autonomous farm equipment. It doesn't need human uh, intervention in order to operate it. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Yes, thank you. Didn't know we'd be talking about robots this morning. Uh, next up is Dustin Brighton. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, and represent the report done right. I appreciate you allowing me to be here today and testify and to uh, Mr. Mr. Brighton, your uh, Mr. Brighton, your connection is not very good. I'm going to go to the next testifier and um, maybe you can try to get somewhere where we have better signal. Uh, next, we have Tyler Deers. Please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Yes. Uh, Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify this morning in opposition to House File 1156. Uh, my name is Tyler Deers. I serve as the Midwest Executive Director for the Technology Trade Association, TechNet. Um, throughout the last half dozen years or so, state ledger legislatures through, across the United States have debated and rejected similar bills um, that is before the committee today on the grounds of safety, security and privacy and legal issues that would arise should a bill like this become law. I know our testimony in the previous committee jurisdiction covered much of the safety and security issues with the bill that we have. My focus today will be on the potential legal issues that may arise should this bill become law. So uh, first, we, we believe there are some potential contract clause issues. Um, this legislation may have the effect of interfering with existing contracts. For example, uh, there are many OEMs that have entered into contracts with authorized service providers. Um, if this legislation were to go into effect, uh, what would become of those existing contracts? Uh, the state would essentially be forcing commerce without a contract and authorized repair providers would be at a significant disadvantage to those without an existing contract. Uh, forcing commerce could nullify or impinge these contracts between authorized service providers and OEMs. Essentially, the state's saying, no, you have to do business with everyone and anyone. However, a business generally has the right to, com to compete and to choose who it does business with. Uh, second, since the bill is broad to cover many products, it will undoubtedly lead to disputes over what is covered under the act. For example, uh, the bill requires OEMs to make available parts, tools, and software to any independent repair provider that is willing to hang a shingle. Well, what parts? Tools, what tools specifically? Software, which software? Uh, there may be hundreds or thousands of parts and tools. Uh, these issues will inevitably be litigated, not to mention how will the state plan to protect and govern the intellectual property of these parts and tools? Also wanted to point out really quickly that customers have a lot of options uh, to have their products repaired. From Minnesota-based retailers such as Best Buy, authorized service providers, independent repair providers, and some companies are making the shift to allow for self-service of their devices. OEMs and authorized repair firms are uniquely qualified to ensure- uh, Mr. Deers, we'll need you to wrap up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I conclude my testimony. All right, thank you. Uh, it looks like Mr. Brighton uh, got a different connection, so we'll go back to Mr. Brighton. Please introduce yourself for the record and then uh, start over with your testimony. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, my name is Dustin Brighton, and I represent the Repair Done Right Coalition. And that coalition is in opposition today, uh, HF 1156. The Repair Done Right Coalition is made up of companies, organizations, and people who care about ensuring that innovative products are repaired and maintained in an authorized manner. We feel that this bill uh, offers uh, a lot of questions when it comes to uh, the protections for intellectual property. I think there's some legal questions there. I don't want to represent myself as an attorney, but uh, I do think that uh, there are some points here with regard to possible litigation that need to be considered with regard to this bill. Um, for over seven years, there we have uh, been watching these bills, opposing these bills. Uh, they have not passed. There are obvious reasons for that. 
Um, the Vermont Attorney General uh, in the last two years has issued a report uh, where um, it basically acknowledged that there are legal questions to uh, this type of le legislation uh, if it were uh, to pass. As far as the AG, uh, I think that there should be questions of the office um, if uh, they're going to decide which parts have to be made available or which software has to be defined, um, how it's going to be defined for enforcement of this law if it or this bill if it were to pass into law. So I'll just summarize there um, and uh, cut my testimony and appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here today uh, in opposition of HF 1156. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Next, I have Gay Gordon Byrne. Um, please introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. Hi, uh, yes, hello. I'm trying to make myself visible. Hopefully, oh, there we are. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for allowing me to testify. Uh, my name is Gay Gordon Byrne. I'm the executive director of what's known as repair.org, but our real name is the Digital Right to Repair Coalition. We're a group of um, over 400 associations, businesses, and individuals that are working together as a coalition to try to bring these bills um, through the process and, and to, uh, into passage. So um, I was asked to speak to the origins of the bills and how we came by um, of enforcement of, by the Attorney General. And the answer is, as um, Representative Fisher said, uh, it has its origins in automotive right to repair, the law specifically um, that was passed in Massachusetts references the existing attorney general and their statutory responsibility to enforce consumer protection law. And that's pretty much where it, the enforcement lies in most states. There's 34 states that have introduced bills of various kinds. And it seems that the preference of the legislature is to, have, to use existing enforcement. Uh, we did not demand it be the attorney general. It's always been the choice of the legislature how to do enforcement, but it fits very well with consumer protection law. Um, that's really how we came to that business. I will say, since I have the opportunity, that um, the questions raised by a couple of the people about legal, legal problems are really based on um, the idea that the only requirement of the bill is that the manufacturers make the same information, parts and tools available to the independent and the consumer that they already make available to their authorized repair providers. So it, it's, there's really no question. It is just simply whatever they already do. Uh, and that's a pretty light touch. There's nothing in here that says they have to disclose any trade secrets. There's no relationship whatsoever to copyright law because that's federal. Uh, states can't mess with that, and we're not messing with that. So happy to take any questions, and that concludes my testimony. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Next, I have Amanda LaGrange. Please introduce yourself for the record, and then go ahead with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee. My name is Amanda LaGrange. I have the honor of being the CEO of an organization based in St. Paul Midway neighborhood and in Golden Valley called Tech Dump and Tech Discounts. And on behalf of our team of 85 employees, we share our support for House File 1156. We've been in business um, for over 10 years. We've processed over 35 million pounds of electronics. That's a lot. And yet we're still not seeing all of them. Um, so we support uh, House File 1156. We also believe that the Attorney General is well positioned to enforce the provisions in this bill. Um, well, I could talk at length uh, about how this is a great job creator, especially uh, in the work that we do where we use this business model as a paid workforce training tool for adults with a history of incarceration or in recovery. Um, I want to focus a little bit on some of the, the past comments I've heard about independent repair shops. Presently, we process around 4 million pounds a year, but only 10% by weight can be refurbished because of how difficult and how costly it is to access repair parts and repair manuals. And we could do so much more if we could, in an economic and, and viable way, access those materials. Our team is well-trained. We have an in-house uh, technician trainer making sure that people know what they're doing. We hold third-party certifications and have annual audits. And we hold a significant amount of insurance. 
we understand that customers are expecting um, high quality service from us. And I firmly believe that if we were unqualified to do this work as an independent repair shop, that our business wouldn't have thrived for 10 years and seen the type of growth that we've seen, especially during the pandemic, as people needed technology and needed to repair items given supply chain issues. And finally, I also wanna mention that we offer a one year warranty on all of the item, all of the refurbished items we sell and repairs. Um, so I invite just a different perspective of independent repair and I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Next, I have Emily Barker. Please introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. Good morning. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Emily Barker, and I am the Executive Director of Reuse Minnesota. I'm here today in support of House File 1156. Reuse Minnesota is a nonprofit dedicated to advancing reuse in our state. Our members include small and large repair businesses, retail stores, and rental shops, as well as government entities, consultants, and individuals who support reuse. In a survey of our members, 100% of respondents support or strongly support passage of right to repair legislation in Minnesota. Reuse Minnesota supports digital right to repair legislation because accessible repair throughout the state of Minnesota is critical to advancing the environmental, social, and economic benefits of a reuse-based economy. We support the enforcement of this legislation by the Attorney General. The Attorney General, as he mentioned, works to ensure the consumer protections and right to repair would do exactly that by supporting the right of Minnesotans to fix and therefore fully own the electronics, appliances, and other goods they purchase. Unfortunately, as has been mentioned, some manufacturers have made repair of such items unnecessarily difficult by limiting access to parts, diagnostic equipment, manuals, and the tools necessary to properly identify and safely make repairs. This often creates a monopoly on repair to the detriment of individuals and independent Minnesota repair businesses. It is in the best interest of our state to have the Attorney General enforce this important legislation. The reuse sector, as we have found in previous impact studies, already accounts for 55,000 jobs in Minnesota. Let's grow that number by supporting our local repair shops and technicians and passing digital right to repair. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next is John Helmers. Please introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Good morning. My name is John Helmers, and I'm the Executive Director of the Solid Waste Administrators Association, also known as SWA, which is an affiliate of the Association of Minnesota Counties. SWA is an organization of people who manage solid waste for counties and solid waste management districts, as required by the Waste Management Act. SWA supports the HALA 1150 Digital Fair Repair Bill and thinks it's critical that enforcement by the Attorney General is included. Our members manage electronic waste through collecting, dismantling, transporting, and the electronic devices to recyclers for further processing as established in the Minnesota Electronics Recycling Act. The goals of that law have not been fully realized due to a lack of clear enforcement. The Pollution Control Agency lacks the means to ensure the full costs of recycling are covered by the manufacturers. And so the counties and or consumers are bearing the majority of those costs. The AG is tasked with dealing with consumer protection and antitrust action. As, a such, we think, as such, we think that office is best suited to see that the digital fair repair bills goals are met. As you know, the highest and best way to manage waste is to prevent waste from being created. House File 1156 does this by enabling the owners of electronic waste that have the device repaired, or if that's not possible due to damage, have parts salvaged for repair of other devices. Allowing Minnesota the ability to repair more electronic devices will reduce the amount of electronic waste and prevent recycling and disposal costs from being incurred. A law with clear authority for its enforcement makes sure that we can prevent as much waste as possible. Thank you for your consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you for your testimony this morning. Next, I have Corey Donovan. Please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Good morning, Chair Becker-Finn and the committee. 
Uh, I'm Corey Donovan, president of Alta Technologies. Thank you for your time this morning uh, in our support of HF 1156. So most of you have experienced the obsolescence of your phones and personal tech. It's fast and frustrating, right? Now imagine IT people at our local Minnesota employers. It happens all around them every day. And we know this because Alta works with our state's IT managers. We buy their old data center equipment, provide them with second user hardware. We're an independent refurbisher. And we're proud of what we do, making basic fixes, customizing equipment for the next user. And one of the easy things we do, bear with me, is pull old stickers off of equipment. Did you know that uh, IT folks will name and label their servers and switches? Uh, yeah, we'll buy gear from Ryan companies or Polaris or whoever, and it comes in with names on them, like Kirby or Herbie or even Goldie, like this switch here. Um, and it makes sense, not just IT, because IT people can be quirky, uh, but also because this equipment is important, um, it's made to last, it's made to serve hundreds or thousands of users, and it's dependable. So when we take that sticker off, you wonder, uh, who is the switch going to be next? Is it going to be an Oli or Alina at Kowalski's server room? Is it going to be a KG at a Hormel office? But increasingly, we worry that it won't be any of those things. Um, we've been doing this for 27 years here in Plymouth. We employ 60 people, expert engineers, some of them with 20 years of experience here, and we've never had more challenges to getting access to patches, fixes, and firmware updates, even for you know, helping our clients get those things. So we just believe that by allowing the Attorney General to enforce this act and bring this act forward, we can ensure a fair marketplace for digital repair. We're just asking for reasonable terms. So let's extend the life of Goldie uh, for another you know, seven to 10 years rather than be in a landfill in two to four. And in that process, we're gonna bolster our local Minnesota repair and tech jobs. So on behalf of uh, my industry, I just want to thank you for your sincere consideration. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Next, I have Stu Lorry. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Good morning, uh, Chair Becker Finn and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Stu Lorry, and I'm the Government Relations Director for Minnesota Farmers Union. We're a, a grassroots general farm organization that has worked to advance the economic interests of our family farmer members since 1918. And on behalf of those members, I'm here to express our strong support for Rep Fisher's bill to ensure that farmers can fix their own equipment should they choose to do that. And briefly, this, this matters to our members as a matter of practice and a matter of, of a principle. In, in, in practice, when they need to make repairs during the narrow planting or harvest windows, it, it matters to have independent repair shops or be able to make small fixes on their own. And in principle, our members believe strongly that they own equipment that they purchased and should be able to make sure and maintain it and keep it in, in, in good working order. So uh, more specific to the concerns of your committee, I wanna express our support for entrusting the Attorney General's office with enforcement. This legislation would provide rights to consumers, to our members, uh, and to ensure a more competitive market for repair. And this is absolutely consistent with the AG's core mission of protecting consumers and enforcing existing antitrust law. And based on our members' direct experience working with those teams at the Attorney General's office on a variety of issues, we believe they're well positioned to do that. So with that, I'll just end with, with a couple short points. Uh, one, I want to be on the record, our members don't want to modify their equipment and certainly not to skirt emission standards. That's against the law, right? We want to repair our stuff, put it back in good working order. We don't need access to source code or trade secrets or anything like that to do that. Second, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer, similar to some folks who've testified, but my understanding is that MOUs, like what the um, uh, auto industry operates under, are, are different than industry commitments. And um, that's meaningful. This would provide something uh, different than this already be being provided to farmers and otherwise uh, others who operate uh, digital equipment. And finally, on the issue of liability, uh, farmers have been repairing their own equipment or having it repaired by independent technicians for generations. This law doesn't change the issue of liability with, with, with regard to that equipment. So I want to thank the Attorney General's Office for their strong uh, working relationship on this and other issues. Uh, Rep. Fisher for his leadership and your time uh, here today. Um, we support this legislation and we support leaving enforcement with the AG's office. Thank you and happy to stick around for questions. Thank you. Uh, finally, Laura Horner, please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Good morning. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Laura Horner, Chair of the Association of Recycling Managers. 
OWN is a Minnesota nonprofit that brings together city, county, and state recycling staff. We meet regularly with our members to ensure quality waste reduction and recycling programs throughout Minnesota. We know that many modern repairs involve electronic components. Repairing those electronics requires information, parts, and other specs related to the digital repair from the product designers. Many manufacturers make it impossible, whether inadvertently or intentionally, for consumers or independent repair technicians to fix their products. This leaves consumers with few other options than to buy new. Reusing and repairing items rather than buying new is essential for the cities and counties that make up ARM to meet our waste reduction and diversion goals. Several of our members operate that represent counties operate fix-it clinics. These are peer-to-peer -peer opportunities for repairing personal items such as small kitchen appliances, lamps, and personal electronics. A barrier to success of these events and other do-it-yourself efforts can be the availability of the parts and tools necessary for that repair. While right to repair may be an issue primarily of smartphones and laptops now, it will quickly become a greater issue throughout our homes as more and more consumer goods incorporate electronics into their designs. Uh, we support enforcement of this legislation by the Attorney General as this law would help us ensure consumer protection it is appropriate for the Attorney General to be in that enforcement role. In addition, this bill is modeled after legislation in other states, which also include Attorney General enforcement. So in summary, to help us support successful waste diversion programs, the Association of Recycling Managers urges the legislature to pass House File 1156 for Digital Fair Repair. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. All right, thank you. Um, that wraps up our testifiers on this bill. Uh, members, as uh, we noticed, uh, we will limit committee discussion today to the enforcement provisions. Uh, first on the list, I have Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair. Um, with that uh, suggestion that limit, limited to enforcement, did the author get a, a fiscal note to this? Because Unless I'm missing something, I don't think there's any cell phones or very little technology being made in Minnesota. Um, does he worry about Minnesota becoming a technology desert or will we be enforcing uh, this law in the Pacific Rim where most of our phones and technology and laptops are coming from? So uh, will this be a massive increase in the Attorney General's office or how, how does the uh, author see this working out. Yep, and not a suggestion. Um, actually, what we're going to follow today, uh, Representative Fisher, a uh, response to uh, Representative Novotny's question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Novotny, for the questions. I do know there was a request put in for a fiscal note. I do not have it with me at the moment. Uh, but from what I recall, I, did, I was not seeing any dollar amounts that were attached to the fiscal note that came through. Uh, and staff may be able to clarify that. Uh, I would defer to the to the fiscal staff here to answer that. And uh, going to the desert comment, I can say that in some areas right now, we already have a desert to get your uh, digital equipment repaired. I do know that in some instances, we already have a desert out there for repair. So let's try to uh, address the problem, make sure that we've got a strong enforcement from the AG to take care of this. Um, and staff is telling me that a fiscal note has been posted, so it should be there for folks. Uh, it was done last year and showed uh, zero fiscal cost. Uh, follow up, Representative Otney. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, I, I, I'm back to this basic question. How are we going to be doing this enforcement of manufacturing and not only our, not only in our state, not, it's not in our country, it's not on our continent? Um, how, how, is, how does the Attorney General's office plan on enforcing that? Um, I believe we have uh, Assistant Attorney General Elizabeth Odette here. Uh, Ms. Odette, if you could introduce yourself for the record and respond to that question, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. My name is Elizabeth Odette. I'm an Assistant Attorney General with the Minnesota Attorney General's office in the Consumer Wage and Antitrust Division. I've been an attorney for approximately uh, 17 years, joining the office uh, April of 2020. Uh, to answer your question, uh, the place where we would be enforcing would simply be here in Minnesota. The jurisdiction is that the manufacturers sell product here in Minnesota, and that's how Minnesota 
is able to um, obtain jurisdiction over those uh, uh, companies, uh, and it would be focused specifically on the uh, place where the repairs are and repairs are happening here in Minnesota um, or uh, being elsewhere. Thank you, uh, Ms. Odette. Uh, final follow-up, Representative Novotny, and then I want to get to your colleagues. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the suggestions on uh, clarifying my uh, comments. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Becker-Finn, Representative Fisher, I understand the reason that you're bringing this bill forward. Uh, it's come up uh, for a number of years. Uh, the concerns I have on it deals with the liability. Uh, liability is the purview of this committee. And I'm wondering if you can answer this question for me. Uh, should there be an, be an issue after an attempted repair or alteration of a device, whether it's a phone, whether it's a computer, whether it's the uh, autonomous driving uh, John Deere tractor? Who would be responsible for any damage or liability um, if something should happen, even if some somebody would be killed? Because I know we've had electronic stuff repaired in the past and they actually can cause a fire. Um, so who would be uh, responsible, the place of the repair or the manufacturer if it was happened to still be under warranty after it had been altered? Uh, Representative Fisher. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I do have, uh, I believe one of my test buyers will be able to help answer that question a little bit better than I could. Uh, and I would like to defer, and I can't remember, I think might be Gay might be the one that has the best answer to that. All right, uh, Gay gordon Byrne, uh, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, actually nothing changes about liability and nothing in the contracts that manufacturers provide to their customers alter either. Uh, manufacturers always disclaim liability, um, even during the warranty period, because they don't want it. Um, I've been a manufacturer and uh, under contract law, I've never seen any lawyer that said we want liability. So they disclaim everything they possibly can. Nothing changes about um, personal injury law. And it's really important that these laws stay the way they are. And so there's nothing changed about them. Um, liability in terms of who pays. Um, the owner pays unless the item is under warranty. And most of these items aren't repaired independently unless they're out of warranty. So most of this bill, although it doesn't say it specifically, most of this bill applies to out of warranty equipment as a practical matter. All right, thank you. Uh, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize, I'm up in bonding soon, so I'm trying to listen to when they call me. <laughs> um, so I, I met with some constituents of mine on this last week, and um, so they have a lot of concerns about how this will be enforced for them as a dealer. So the dealers provide all these different parts and provide training. They are not opposed to consumers using this, but um, if if the their concern is really on the cost of the fair um, and reasonable, which really means they have to sell it at wholesale. So they're gonna lose so much of their business model is based on selling parts. So how will that be enforced? Like if they can't, do they have to under the statute representative Fisher sell these products to their like retail customers at wholesale? Is that the interpretation? Uh, representative Fisher. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Robbins. Uh, in the bill itself, it says that the pricing that uh, that the, the that the people for repair are looking for that would be the pricing that they would be going back to the manufacturer for. So, in other words, if they're going to buy it from the dealer, they would still be paying the dealer the same price as they would be paying the dealer otherwise. And Representative Robbins, I'll just note by adding the word enforcement to your question um, doesn't automatically <laughs> keep you in. Uh, section uh, subdivision for the bill, but uh, follow up Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Representative Fisher, just to clarify, if they sold at their current price, instead of the wholesale price, they would be liable under this bill to a, to a customer? Representative Fisher. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. What I will I will do is uh, refer back to uh, uh, Gay Gordon Byrne again. She can answer that, make that very clear. Uh, Ms. Gordon Byrne, quickly, please. Yes, um, I think there may be some confusion over the wording. Uh, the intent of the bill is not to make uh, to cut dealers out, and if we have to uh, change that, we will change that. Right. Thank Madam you. Uh, follow up, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I appreciate that clarification. I think it would be really helpful to all heavy equipment dealers, farm equipment dealers, if there could be an exception created similar to the motor vehicle exception, because that really is a problem. They they welcome people coming and making the repairs. It's not about trying to stop people from making the repairs. It's about um, them being able to charge a reasonable price that enables them to stay in business. We have in Minnesota, just from this one dealer, 570 jobs and 12 um, employers on this. So I hope you'll take a look at that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And this this bill's been around for at least four years. So I think there's been plenty of time to discuss uh, possible amendments with Representative Fisher. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I had um, some legal sort of questions since this is um, judiciary and civil law. And I'm just wondering, um, Representative Fisher, what this bill would do with existing franchise agreements and authorized repair agreements. Representative Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Once again, I will refer to uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Gay Gordon uh, Byrne to help clarify that. Uh, Ms. Uh, Gordon Byrne, go ahead. Yep, yeah, um, it does nothing. These are private agreements. The bill does not interfere with any of these private agreements. If you own a McDonald's franchise um, and a Burger King opens up, there's nothing in this bill that would prevent that as an example, maybe a bad example, but it should do nothing. Um, people that are authorized to repair Apple equipment will still have that authorization. Uh, Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm concerned that it's a breach of contract though, because um, you have a contract with you know, these exclusive contracts um, with franchise agreements or authorized repair agreements, and then you're adding a third party into the uh, equation. And so I, I'm concerned that um, it, it would be breaking the contract. Do you have concerns over that? Um, I will note, uh, Representative Scott, that the applicability is that it would only apply to equipment sold on or uh, January 1st, 2022. Um, Representative Fisher. Uh, and I, that's what I was going to pick up off of this is where the enforcement date is coming in and the effective date coming in, it would apply to things after that point in time. So I don't think it would be an issue. Uh, Representative Scott. So no existing contracts is what you're saying would be affected at all. Is, is your take on the bill? Uh, Representative Fisher. Uh, that would be my understanding is that the that it would not have an impact on that. Uh, however, I would also refer, refer back to uh, Ms. Gay Gordon Byrne to make sure I am properly stating that. All right, Ms. Gordon Byrne, and then we're going to move on. Um, <clears throat> these agreements that you're concerned about, they are private agreements. And having a franchise does not guarantee profit, and it does not guarantee that there's no statute that impacts those agreements. So I think it is it is it is within the legislature their ability to control this law that they could decide if they wanted those agreements to basically those agreements are currently allowing monopolies and so as a matter of antitrust I think it's important to keep keep that in mind that these are not these are agreements that are private between different businesses and they have an impact on consumers which is highly unfair and deceptive under a variety of statutes, and they're also monopolistic. So um, yes, I think the legislature has the ability to do that. So it's uh, final final follow-up representative. Th thank you, Madam Chair. So it's not addressed in this bill, is what she's saying. And it puts these contracts at risk because it's not addressed in this bill. I just want to make that clear to the members of the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments. Thank you to our testifiers. Um, with that, uh, Representative Fisher, I think we've fully uh, discussed subdivision four and we will move on to the vote. Uh, Representative Long renews his motion that House File 1156 be referred to the General Register. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker-Finn. Aye. Vice Chair Muller. Aye. 
Representative Scott? No. Representative Feist? Aye. Representative Frazier? Aye. Representative Grossel? No. Representative Her? Aye. Representative Hollins? Aye. Representative Johnson? No. Representative Liebling? Aye. Representative Long? Aye. Representative Mortensen? No. Representative Novotny? No. Representative Farr? No. Representative Robbins? No. Representative Bain? Aye. And Representative Zhang? Aye. That is 10 ayes and seven nays. Great. The motion prevails and House File 1156 is on its way to the General Register. Uh, thank you, Representative Fisher, and to all the testifiers who participated today. Um, next, members, we're going to move on to something uh, a little bit different than what we normally do in committee, but I think it's really important. And I really want to thank our uh, House Research Team, and in particular, Ben Johnson, um, for putting this together. I, before we get into a discussion of Representative Holland's bill, um, we're going to do kind of a walkthrough, sort of a um, the uh, adjunct law professor in me uh, wanted to make sure we're all grounded in what the law actually is right now. And so uh, we will go to Ben Johnson for a presentation on the Fourth Amendment and search warrants. And um, we will have some time for questions at the end, but I want to make sure that uh, Mr. Johnson has the ability to walk through everything and folks can kind of digest things uh, before we move to questions. So with that, we'll turn it over to you, uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you so much uh, for putting this together for us today. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair members. I'm going to start sharing my screen here. And hopefully that works for everybody. So I'm going to walk through, I've been asked to walk through Fourth Amendment and search warrant information. As you might imagine, this is a very, very large topic. Uh, there are classes in law school that spend probably an entire semester on this particular topic, and I'm going to try to cover it in roughly 20 minutes. So some of this is going to be fairly high level, but hopefully it will be helpful and informative. Any discussion about the the search warrant issue has to start with the constitutional protections. There are constitutional protections in the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution and also in the Minnesota Constitution. They are, as you can see, hopefully essentially identical. There's some slight differences in the punctuation, but the language is the same. The Minnesota Supreme Court is free to find that the Minnesota Constitution offers greater protections for individuals, but they have not done so. The interpretation has been identical, which means that the interpretation of federal law typically applies to Minnesota. It's important to remember whenever we're talking about a constitutional limitation that the Constitution establishes a floor. It doesn't create a ceiling on rights. The Bill of Rights limits government action, and those protections set a base level, and laws can't give individuals lower levels of protection. They can, however, legislatures can pass laws that give individuals greater levels of protection. So just because something is uh, meets a constitutional standard does not automatically mean that it always meets a standard that's been established in law. So the constitutional protection on searches is related to what's called an unreasonable search. The Constitution prohibits those unreasonable searches, which means that a, a reasonable search is allowable under the Constitution. A search is considered unreasonable if it involves a place where a person has a reasonable expectation of privacy. If the person doesn't have an expectation of privacy, then the constitutional protections do not apply. This is always a very fact-based decision. The decisions turn on the specific facts that are in front of a court at any given time, and similar situations may inform those decisions, but they don't always have clear answers. When a court looks at the question of reasonableness, it has a two-part question. The first is what we'd call subjective, and the second is uh, objective. The subjective question is whether that person had an actual expectation of privacy, whether that person really thought that the thing that was going to be searched was private. The second question is whether that 
that belief was reasonable? And that's an objective question. And it applies if society generally recognizes a place or a thing as private. So if something's generally, a vis a, generally, me, generally visible or accessible to the public, it's typically not considered private. Whereas if it's in your home or somewhere else that's private, it is considered protected. So an example I have here is a garbage can. If you empty your garbage, take it down the night before pickup and put it at the curb, that's gonna be open and accessible to the public. And uh, law enforcement is extremely unlikely to need a warrant to search your garbage can. However, the garbage can in your kitchen, even though it's garbage and you may not really want it, is in your home and you're going to have an expectation of privacy in that particular garbage can. So again, the specific facts will always matter and those facts can change depending also on where you are and your situation. So if you're walking down the street carrying a bag or a purse, your expectation of privacy and what's in that bag is probably reasonable. And if you were going to be searched, there would probably need to be a warrant or exception. But if you go to airport security and you're going to get on a plane, that expectation changes because of where you are and your environment. You know going into the airport, you're going to have to go through security and it will have to be scanned or opened and looked. Similarly, your ownership of a home typically establishes that you have privacy interest in the home. But visiting someone else's home, you probably do not have an expectation of privacy. If you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in a place, then a search is unreasonable unless one of two things exists. The first is that the peace officer doing the search has a warrant. And the second is that an exception to the warrant requirement applies. I'm going to start talking through warrants, and then we'll get to the exceptions briefly in a little bit. In Minnesota, warrants are governed basically by three different things. One is statute, and I have the citations here, but it's in Chapter 626, starting at 626.04 and going to 626.19. There are also rules of criminal procedure that apply, and there's case law that controls. In general, the default search warrant is what you would refer to as a daytime knock and announce warrant. That's the typical standard warrant. You need to make a base showing to get that warrant that I'll go through in a minute. But the expectation is that that's the kind of warrant you would typically get. Case, uh, case law and statute establish this. There's a statute specifically saying that a warrant needs to be executed during the day. That's between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. There's a different statute that applies to an arrest of a person and the need to announce your authority and purpose before entering. That's section 629.33. The Supreme Court has said that that requirement on an arrest also applies to search warrants. So even though that statute's not in the search warrant area of law, it does apply to search warrants. When an officer is making a warrant application, there are two different ways to do it. The typical default way is that it's made in writing, but it can, in certain circumstances, be done orally. The oral often happens if there's some sort of pressure or rush to do something, particularly late at night, and an officer needs to make a phone call, talk to a judge. But in either situation, the information has to be given under oath. I'm not going to walk through all the details within these two rules, but I'll note here that when testimony is given orally, the judge is supposed to make a written record of that, and that written record becomes the record that gets reviewed if there's a question about the search warrant later. When an application is made, the application has certain things that it needs to include. It needs to show that the items being sought are related to criminal activity. Section 626.07 lists out in more detail what that can include, but in general, you're looking for stolen items, items that are evidence that a crime has been committed or is about to be committed. The application needs to identify with some specificity exactly who's involved in the search, exactly what is going to be searched and what location is going to be searched. It needs to have sufficient facts to establish probable cause. The probable cause standard can vary a little. I'll get into that in a little in a minute. But in general, there needs to be probable cause that there's a connection to criminal activity 
and also that the area that's going to be searched contains the identified items. The facts needed to establish this probable cause need to be in the application. This is sometimes referred to as the four corners doctrine, which basically says that all of the information needed to support a warrant to support probable cause for a warrant need to be contained within the four corners of the application of the document. So essentially you're writing it out in a paper. If it's not in that paper, then a judge should not consider it. Warrants shouldn't contain standard boilerplate language only. They can contain some standard boilerplate language, of course, but they need to have specific facts that relate to the specific situation Judges issue warrants in Minnesota. That's typically true most places. Sometimes it'll say judge or uh, some other similar type official, but in Minnesota, you're going to a judge. There has to be the probable cause to get the warrant. The judge has to review and determine that there is probable cause and make that determination based on the application. A judge can limit warrants if an application says that uh, uh, there needs to be a search or that a peace officer wants to search both a house and a garage a peace off, uh, and, and puts in information that's insufficient to justify searching the house. A judge can say, I'll give you the warrant to search the garage, but not the house. All of those details are going to depend on the specific scenario that's being presented. The probable cause determination is frankly somewhat loose. It's a difficult standard to describe. Here's some case law that I'm putting up here, but basically it's, it's got to be a common sense decision based on whether or not there's a fair probability that contraband and evidence of a crime is going to be found. I thought I'd take a moment just to review briefly the standards of proof here. Um, these are the five fairly common standards of proof that appear uh, in criminal cases and in law in general. The highest level is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the amount of proof needed to convict someone of a crime. It's really only used in that particular setting with a few other exceptions, but it's basically for convicting someone of a crime. Clear and convincing evidence is a high standard of proof. It is the level of proof that you need in general to remove a person from a home, excuse me, remove a child from a home, like in a child protection case or to terminate parental rights. The preponderance of the evidence standard comes up most frequently within civil law. Preponderance of the evidence is described as more likely than not or greater than 50%. That's your sort of your scales. And if it tips one way or the other, even slightly, that's enough for preponderance of the evidence. Below that are probable cause and reasonable suspicion. Both probable cause and reasonable suspicion need to be based on specific facts. They, ha they can't just be a hunch. But the probable cause standard based on that word probable is that something is probably true, that there's a good chance that it's true. And that opinion has to be based on specific identifiable facts, not just a feeling. Reasonable suspicion standard is slightly lower than probable cause. Again, it's somewhat loose in a lot of ways, but it has to be reasonably likely that a thing is true. And that reasonable likelihood needs to be based, again, on some specific facts. It can't just be a hunch or a feeling. I bring up those standards as we move to both nighttime warrants and no-knock warrants. Nighttime warrants are discussed in both statutes, 626.14, and in more detail in several cases. The standard for a nighttime warrant is that there needs to be reasonable suspicion to believe that that nighttime search is necessary, either to preserve evidence or protect the officer or public safety. So again, you need to qualify for a regular warrant to begin with, you need to have the probable cause to get the initial search warrant. If once you establish that probable cause, you want to execute the warrant at night, in addition to that probable cause showing, you need to show reasonable suspicion that would justify the nighttime warrant. The no-knock warrant standard is essentially identical in nature to the nighttime warrant. There's a recently enacted statute that spells it out in detail, that's 626.14. The language that is in that statute is essentially codifying what was existing case law. And again, there needs to be a finding of reasonable suspicion that knocking and announcing the presence is either going to be dangerous or going to result in the destruction of evidence. 
a warrant can be a daytime no-knock warrant where the the judge says you can't serve it at night. It can be a nighttime warrant, but a knock and announce warrant. Most commonly though, if peace officers are looking for a nighttime and or a no-knock warrant, they're looking for both of those things. And the facts used to justify one can be the same as the facts used to justify the other. Although they could, you could rely on different facts to justify. There are always limits on the search. Whatever is in the warrant is what you're limited to searching for, both the area and the items that are being searched for. There are some exceptions that we'll get into in a minute, but if the warrant says that you are looking for a stolen television and you believe it's in a particular house, you can go into that house to look for the stolen television, but you can't start opening dresser drawers and cabinets that are obviously too small to hold that television. Search warrants typically need to be executed within 10 days. They can be extended in certain circumstances. Officers need to provide a copy of the warrant and a receipt for any property that is seized. Individual law enforcement agencies have their own policies and standard practices or procedures relating to the time and methods of entry and things like that. That is not in statute, that is not in case law, but certainly exists around the state for different law enforcement agencies. So just a brief review as we're gonna leave warrants here in just a second. The warrant application needs to be a sworn statement. It needs to contain very specific facts. A judge has to review all of that information that's in the sworn statement without looking outside of that. Based on the information there and reasonable inferences just from that information, the judge has to determine if there's probable cause. If the judge decides that there is probable cause, the judge can issue the warrant. If the officers also want a nighttime or a no-knock or both a nighttime and no-knock warrant, they have to show reasonable suspicion that that daytime knock and announce entry is either dangerous or going to result in the destruction of evidence. And finally, that search warrant, the search when it's being executed is limited to the time and the place and the items that are actually authorized and identified in the warrant. Except that there are many exceptions. So now we move to the exceptions. There's a long list I'm going to get to in just a second. There are multiple exceptions. They are established in case law for various reasons. These are, again, exceptions to that floor that's established by the Constitution. So a search that falls under the exceptions is considered reasonable in the same way as if a warrant had been issued to authorize that search. State laws can establish other limits, though. If the state says the Fourth Amendment protections are not satisfactory to the state and the legislature wants to give individuals a greater level of protection than the Constitution gives, the legislature can make that decision. This is a list of common exceptions, and I'm going to talk about the bigger one, exigent circumstances, in more detail in a minute. I'm going to run through these very quickly. Again, we could probably spend an hour and a half talking about these individual things. But a search incident to arrest authorizes peace officers to basically search a person in the immediate area around a person when an arrest takes place. It doesn't extend typically to things like blood draws or cavity searches. You would usually need a warrant or some extra reason to get to there, but you can search the whole person. That's for weapons, that's for evidence of a crime. A consent search opens the door to search the, anything that's where there's consent to do that search. The plain view exception applies when officers are legally in a place and there is evidence of some crime that's in plain view. Imagine they're executing the search warrant um, looking for the stolen television. While they're in somebody's home, they see sitting out on the counter drugs. Those are in plain view. They don't have to ignore that, but they can't start searching through drawers and, and cupboards and things like that to see if there are drugs. The Terry stop and Terry search provisions relate to a famous case called Terry versus Ohio that in very brief terms authorizes police officers to stop individuals based on reasonable suspicion that those individuals are involved in crime. And if the officer has a reasonable concern for the officer's safety, the officer can do a pat down search for weapons. That's called a Terry search. 
That Terry search often leads to what we call the plain feel doctrine. This is a variation of the plain view doctrine, but if the police are doing a pat down of someone and feel something in a pocket that's not a weapon, but they're confident that they know what it is, they can, they don't have to ignore that. This most often comes up with a stop on the street where there's a Terry search pat down for weapons and officers feel drugs in somebody's pocket. That's the most common situation when that comes up. There's a community caretaker exception. This applies when police are called to do a welfare check or called because or go to a house or some other place because they're legitimately concerned for someone's safety. They're allowed to enter. If they're in a house based on this community caretaker thing and something's in plain view, then both of those exceptions could apply. There's an inventory search that is an exception that allows officers to inventory anything they're taking into custody for reasonable and normal reasons. This comes off most, up most often in towing vehicles. If they tow a vehicle, they're allowed to go through the vehicle, see what's in it. It's to protect the law enforcement agents and, and agencies from an allegation of theft or destruction of property. But again, if they find evidence of a crime while they're doing that, that's legitimate. There's what's generally called the special needs doctrine. This is extremely large. Again, very high level. There are certain categories of individuals who have a lower expectation of privacy and certain places where everybody has a lower expectation of privacy. All of these fall under the special needs doctrine. This would include kids at school. It includes people who are within certain distance of a border. Uh, the, the country's borders may be eligible to be searched. It includes people on probation, just individuals and locations where there's a lower expectation of privacy. And the final one on this list is the automobile exception. The automobile exception, frankly, combines a lot of these other exceptions. In general, you have some expectation of privacy when you're driving your own automobile, but it's reduced. In most cases, people can see into your vehicle. The, the car is movable, so there may be a need to take immediate action. If somebody is stopped in a car, there are multiple areas that are within their reach. And so the Terry search or the search incident to arrest may apply. We could spend again an hour on automobiles alone, but I, for our purposes today, it's just worth knowing that in general, in an automobile, there is a reduced expectation of privacy and many reasons and ways that an officer may have a legitimate ability to conduct a search of the vehicle. The last big exception I wanted to spend some time on is the exigent circumstances exception. A situation is considered exigent when it requires some immediate action. Exigent circumstances usually exist when the delay that would be needed to get a warrant is gonna cause either the removal or destruction of evidence or gonna create some danger to the public. These, like many of the other exceptions, are truly heavily fact-based. It's going to depend on the totality of the circumstances, and a judge will have to determine essentially whether a police officer made the right call in the situation. And the right call would be that there was this need to take some immediate action to present destruction, prevent destruction of evidence or to prevent someone from leaving or escaping. The final thing I really wanna go through is relief. The primary form of relief for a warrant violation or an unreasonable or illegal search is that the evidence found would be suppressed. That would happen in a criminal case. If evidence is discovered in violation of the person's rights, that evidence can't be introduced in trial against them. Beyond that, evidence that is discovered because of the illegal evidence is also prohibited from being introduced. That's often referred to as the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine, where if the police got some information and used that information to get other information or evidence, that additional information or evidence also has to be excluded if the first step has to be excluded. If a peace officer gets a warrant through what's called malicious procurement or willfully exceeds the scope of the warrant, those are crimes under Minnesota law. That's a misdemeanor offense under 626.22. There also, of course, may be internal discipline for illegally obtaining a search warrant or uh, violating any of these sort of standards. Those would be on the individual agency level. The victim of an illegal search can also, of course, have grounds to file a lawsuit. Those grounds may be based in an allegation that the officers violated their civil rights, 
or potentially just the destruction of property kind of claim, it'll vary. Madam Chair, I tried to go quickly and also cover a lot of information. I hope that was helpful. I'm assuming there will be some questions along the way, um, but I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it back to you. I thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, you uh, heroes work uh, in the House Research Department today in uh, trying to distill a, you know, an entire several weeks of criminal procedure uh, into a 20 minute presentation. Uh, really appreciate you putting the time and the effort into um, educating us. Uh, Vice Chair Moeller. Um, thank you so much, Chair Becker Finn. And boy, when I was in law school, Mr. Johnson, it would have been really helpful to have you uh, get, walk me through that before my exams or before the bar exam. Um, but that was a really great summary of the law. And just so um, folks are clear, you know, the, the, the person applying for the search warrant is an officer. Um, and Mr. Johnson, I have a question for you about when it's alleged that an officer lies in a search warrant. Um, I know we do what in Minnesota, um, a Frank's hearing if certain requirements are met. And I'm just wondering if you could explain that a little bit. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Mueller. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Representative Mueller, you may know the Franks hearing standards better than I do off the top of my head, uh, but I will say that if there is an allegation that there has been lying in a search warrant, uh, that's a, a, a statement that's been made under oath. There is a pretty full and formal hearing in front of a judge to make that determination. And officers who are found to have lied in those situations typically go on a, a do not call list with prosecutor offices if false statements have been made. Uh, any future testimony that they wish to give or future warrants they have are looked at with, with greater suspicion. I'm not sure if that answers exactly what you're looking for, but um, if you want more information on all the details of the Franks hearing, I'd frankly want to pull up some case law before I went in detail. Uh, any follow-up, Vice Chair Moeller? Um, thanks, Madam Chair. No, thanks, uh, Mr. Johnson. That, that was really what I was looking for, just so that um, people understand there is a whole mechanism um, that's available if there is an allegation that there's been a lie or misleading information presented in a search warrant. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, just before I go on to my question, just to follow up, since long before the, the Brady and Giglio uh, decisions came down, I, I don't know of one officer in 35 years that made a false statement that uh, was able to keep his job. Um, so it seems kind of redundant, but um, going on, is this gonna to apply to federal warrants that are also, also issued? Will, will a federal agency uh, be able to execute a federal warrant using a no knock and nighttime warrants under the provision of this bill? Uh, Representative Novotny, right now we're not discussing the bill. We're just discussing if you have questions about the Fourth Amendment and the current status of the law. Um, but we can go to you, you know, when we have time to get to the bill. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions specifically for uh, Mr. Johnson. I have no questions for Mr. Johnson. All right. Thank you. Uh, so, members, we haven't even gotten to the bill yet. And I will say we aren't moving the bill today. Um, the point of today was to ground us in the law and try to, to you know, fit in some discussion of the bill. But, uh, you know, if we don't, if we don't get to your questions, we don't get to all the testifiers, we will be back with this bill. We will fully vet and discuss the bill in this committee. Um, I see there are a couple hands up. Uh, if those are for Mr. Johnson as to the underlying law, uh, we can go ahead to those. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. And Mr. Johnson, thank you so much for this. It's uh, um, I, I learned a couple of things that obviously I didn't know before. But I had a question. Um, if there are any court cases right now that you know of, um, decisions, I guess, court decisions that involve um, a person's, uh, a law enforcement's access to a person's cell phone, computer, that sort of thing, um, I've had a bill in the past that the Fourth Amendment would apply to person's cell phones and computers and stuff like that, that a warrant would be needed for law enforcement to access those. And I didn't know if there, yeah, I'm just asking if there are any court cases that you know of, decisions that have been made regarding those things. Uh, Mr. Johnson. 
Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Scott, there absolutely are. There are multiple. Um, I don't think I can go into full detail here. I'm happy to send you a follow-up if, if you want some more information on those cases. In general, you're right. There needs to be some level of search warrant. There are also issues about whether that warrant can force someone to provide, uh, for example, a fingerprint to unlock a phone or a code to unlock the phone. Um, and there are, there are a variety of somewhat nuanced decisions about how much they can be forced to do that. Uh, but yes, absolutely, you would need a search warrant to search the contents of a phone that is going to be private. Uh, Follow-up, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I know this is going to really put you on the spot, Mr. Johnson, but so a bill like I've had in the past, do you think it's needed or not needed? Is it is it already assumed that a warrant is needed so you don't need to articulate in that in the constitutional amendment not sure if uh, mr johnson feels comfortable answering that but i will i will give him an opportunity to respond uh, mr johnson uh, representative scott I, I am going to quite frankly dodge that question a little bit at this point um i think it's it's fair to say that there are certain protections uh but as I mentioned throughout this, there are a lot of exceptions to the warrant requirement, uh, including whether or not a search is considered reasonable or unreasonable under a variety of circumstances. Those protections are Fourth Amendment protections, which again means that they establish a floor for the protection of individuals. And if you and or other members felt that those protections were either not clear enough or were insufficient to give individuals the protections, Minnesotans, the, the protections that you thought were appropriate it would certainly be within the authority of the legislature to pass something that either clarified or strengthened those protections. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, yeah. Final follow-up, Representative Scott, and then I want to go. No, you thank good. you. I knew I was putting him on the spot, but I thought <laughs> I'd try to get any answer I could. So thank you. Yeah. No, I, I promised Mr. Johnson when I asked him to put together this presentation that um, we would we would keep it professional here and uh, respect his position with nonpartisan House research. But uh, appreciate the question nonetheless, Representative Scott. Uh, Representative Grossel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Mr. Johnson, you know, would you uh, would you say yourself that uh, meeting that four corners of, of that search warrant is is vitally important? Um, I don't know that Mr. Johnson needs to answer that question, but uh, Mr. Okay. Johnson. I I mean, looking at looking at I just I just I just want to remind members that Mr. Johnson has put together something really helpful and this is really good information in a very digestible size. And the point here is not to sort of, uh, you know, put him on the spot, um, but for us to learn. So I, you know, just if we can frame our questions in a way that that gets at us all listening and learning, that would be great. Uh, yeah, Representative Grossel. I didn't I, I wasn't meaning to put uh, uh, Mr. Johnson on the spot. Um, I'll say this myself then. To meet those four corners is vitally important uh, in applying for a search warrant. Um, and also the the process, uh, Mr. Johnson, would you just give us just a quick uh, process of, you take the officer's information, the, the probable cause, and he takes it before the judge. So this, the application of the search warrant is not is not something that is just handed out like candy. There is a process to this, and it is to protect people's rights. And like uh, like was uh, stated earlier, you screw up on a search warrant. You screw up on a search warrant, and this was something that I, I I told younger officers as well that would come in. And you screw up on a search warrant. You misrepresent anything on a search warrant for the rest of your career. It, not only could it be a career ender, but You'll you'll be you'll be devoured on the stand for the rest of for the rest of that time. Everything that you do after that will be called into question. So, when when the uh, search warrant is being applied for, you have to make sure your your eyes are dotted, your T's are crossed, and then you take that before the judge. So, you know, I, I just uh, it, more of a I guess it'd be more of a statement than that. This is not a process that anyone takes lightly, whether it be officers, county attorneys or judges. There's a chain. There's a chain of command there, or a chain of process there. So when it goes before a judge, um, it has to be, it has to meet that judge's scrutiny as well. And if officers do work with 
their county attorneys, uh, it has to meet their scrutiny. So, you know, I, I look at some of this stuff um, and the comment made by Representative Moeller, if an officer lies, they're done. If anybody in that chain lies about anything or misrepresents anything, whether it be officer, county attorney, or a judge, they're called into question for the rest of their career, if they have a career after that. So it's, it's uh, I would just want to thank Mr. Johnson for, for this refresher, and it brings back, it brings back all the uh, points that I had to make when preparing search warrants, whether they be uh, knock and announce, nightcap, or no knocks. You have to represent, you have to make sure that people's rights are being protected. And that's first and foremost in an officer's mind when preparing these things, just to give it, just to give you uh, from an officer's, a former officer's perspective. At no time did we ever want to violate anybody's rights because that's our job to protect people's rights and to protect them. So I, again, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, I thank you, Representative Grossel. And I think, um... I think a good point, and I think what Vice Chair Mueller was getting at too, is like I think it is important for folks to realize that there there is a process, and the process involves officers applying for a warrant, the judge making the decision, and you know evidence is gathered, and then a prosecutor decides what to do um, as far as charging. But I think it's it's always good to ground us in the actual process that exists, so we know who the players are and um, how this process currently works. Cause I know I have certainly in the uh, public discussion surrounding warrants in the last um, month or so, I, you know, have certainly seen folks misstating things that uh, prosecutors and uh, you know, officers know uh, you know, how that process works, but the general public is not always aware of that. So that, that is helpful to have that perspective. Uh, Representative Johnson. Well, uh, Chair Becker Finn, I just wanted to thank, uh, Mr. Johnson for the good information he provided, uh, not only for the public that's listening, but also for members of this committee that haven't had to deal with search warrants in the process to obtain a search warrant. And for those of us that have been through that process, understand that the difficulties of obtaining all the information and make sure everything is correct. Because as has been stated, if an officer does not do it properly, uh, it's usually the end of his career. I myself have had search warrants granted, and I've had the judges actually tell me, you need some more information. And I've, I've had to work two, three days to get that, finish that information in order to get that search warrant. Um, so they are taken, the search warrants are not taken lightly, no matter it's, if it's just a, a knock and announce search warrant or a no knock. The information has to be correct. Or, or the officer's credibility is gone. And once that credibility is gone, their, their ability to be a good officer is also gone. And most of them, uh, it's the end of their career. So they do take it very seriously. Hey, thank you, Representative Johnson. And obviously it is 9.57. Um, huge thank you uh, to Mr. Johnson from House Research. I, I also want to thank all of the, the testifiers who were lined up uh, for Representative Holland's bill. I thought it was really important that we have this um, grounding in the law before we moved on to discussion of any potential bills. And I think, um, as was touched on by a lot of the comments here uh, in the last couple minutes, you know, grounding us in the idea that the at the base level, we all have a fourth through the Fourth Amendment, we have a constitutional right to privacy and you know, this this concept that, you know, these aren't uh, bills that are not attached to any other uh, pieces of law and other areas of law that we focus on and um, to ground us in, you know, at it, the, the, the idea of the floor and the ceiling, I think, is really important here where the at, when we discuss Representative Holland's bill more fully at a future hearing, um, remembering that we do have the authority and the power as a state government to um, do more than just the floor um, and to make sure that we uh, we can choose to protect people's rights in ways that we think are important that go um, beyond the, the floor level of what is actually required in our U.S. Constitution. And so um, I apologize that we did not get to any of the, the testifiers today, but I, I hope that you are all listening. I hope that this makes for better testimony in the future and would really encourage members to uh, 
look at Representative Holland's bill and the accompanying materials now when all of this is fresh in your mind um, so that we can have a, a good discussion um, based in uh, fact and based in what the, the law currently is. So um, I thank everybody for sort of indulging this sort of different use of our time in committee, but I thought um, given everything that's gone on, it would be a really good idea to slow us down a little bit and ground us uh, in the Constitution and uh, to have a better understanding of how this process works uh, as we discuss potential bills moving forward. So uh, Representative Hollins, uh, I'm sorry that we did not have time. Um, you you look like you are ready to go and I know that you always are and we will, we will get to it in the future. And I do uh, want to make sure that the public and the members of this committee know that we will give this bill the time that it needs. It is that important. And um, I do want to make sure we have time to fully vet things. We won't be rushing it through. So uh, with that members, thanks again uh, for your time and attention today. And with that, we are adjourned.